we're ready to study the last chapter of the book of Romans this morning in class. There will we will have a, there'll be a number more sermons on Romans, but uh, this will end class for this week. Joe Brown will take over in this class next week. So we'll ask him in a minute when we see him uh, what his topic will be. Uh, I know he had a couple of possibilities in mind. Let's begin class in prayer, and then I've got a question for you. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, thank you for all the servicemen and women who gave their lives for us, for our freedom. Please be with us and with our country and this world that we may have peace. Be with each one in this congregation who is hurting now and grieving over lost loved ones, especially the Durko family. Be with those who are ill and, and help them to recover, especially Sister Hines. Be with each one of us and help us to open our hearts and minds to your word and to learn and to change because we heard what you have to tell us. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I do have a question for you. I do have a question for you. I want to know if you've got a Columbo in your life, somebody who's always got just, well, just one more thing before you go. And that's, that's usually the most important thing they want to talk about. Has anybody got a Columbo? Are any of you Columbo? You didn't quite get to the last and most important thing you wanted to talk to talk about to your spouse or to your children or grandchildren and, and now they're about to leave and you say, wait, wait a minute before you go. Just one more thing. Am I the only one who does that occasionally? Probably not. Probably not. Have you ever been asked by someone else? Hey, do you happen to know so-and-so when they find out that you're a member at West Freeway? Who have they asked you about? Who's, who have you been asked about or who's asked you that? Yes. The preacher? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you know the preacher there? Oh, dear. Uh, that worries me. Uh-huh. Somebody told you that Sunday. I told you that Sunday. Okay. Yeah. I, I, met, I visited, I dropped into an elders meeting at a congregation and uh, somebody was asking me about three or four different people who used to go to West Freeway because he went to West Freeway at one point. How many of you had that conversation? I'm thinking one of these days we're going to be on an interplanetary flight headed to Jupiter and someone's going to ask us, you're from Earth? Would you happen to know... Well, we love to make those connections. And I wouldn't be surprised that those of us who have a lot of friends and are very active with others and are in people's lives influencing them for Christ, that if you said something about New York City, they could name someone there. Or Washington, D.C. They could name someone there that they have contacted in Christ. Paul is, is uh, writing to the church in the churches in Rome, and uh, he has a lot of friendships here. Let me ask you another question. What parts of the Bible do you tend to skip? When you're reading all the way through, is there any part that you might skip once in a while? Numbers. numbers. There's a lot of numbers in numbers. It's well named. Was there any part that we didn't spend a whole lot of time with in Ezra? So and so begets, so and so the begats. You know, that's a really important chapter. I've actually heard a good sermon on, on Matthew chapter 1. And he began with the, the, remember the lesson from this is that everybody forgets. After all, Abraham forgot Isaac and Isaac forgot Jacob. And, and you know, and no, no, it's begat, not forget. But uh, um, at any rate, this is one of those flyover sections. Let's not fly over. Let's read this one and get a little bit more from it. So I did a little digging for us this week. Verse 1. 
I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church in Sincrea. Welcome her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her with anything she may need from you. For she has been a great help to many people, including me. Where's Phoebe from? Where is Phoebe from? Sencrea. Any idea about Sencrea? Sencrea. Uh, Corinth is on a high point between the Aegean Sea on one side and it's there at the Isthmus in the middle of a strait, but you cannot sail between the two points. And Corinth is on one side, is in the middle. On one side... On one sea is Sencrea, and there's another port on the other side. That's why whenever Paul left Corinth and went, to, and went on to uh, head for Jerusalem, he stopped in Sencrea and had his head shorn because he had a vow. Well, at the seaport, you'd probably be able to find every kind of tradesman there was, including a good barber who'd get you a haircut. Sencrea was actually connected to Corinth by a railroad. There were wooden skids set up in which ships would actually be dragged between Corinth and Sincrea loaded so that they could be immediately launched and, and head down on their journey. It was an amazing thing. And so it's very, you're going to see a number of people here from Corinth being discussed, and Phoebe is one of them. She is likely our mail lady carrying this letter to Rome on Paul's behalf. She's one to be greeted. So tell me, how was she described? He's a, she's a servant of the church in St. Crea, which is a, which should not be a point of controversy, but is. Those who would like to expand the role of women into leadership try to point out that this word is the word diakonos in a female form, diakonia, and um, may, it, she may very well have some formal work for the church in Sincrea or Corinth, being from Sincrea herself, and, um, and they point out in 1 Timothy chapter 3, the word for wives, for deacons, is women. Women also have these things. Very possibly, there were formal women with duties in the New Testament church, and, and Phoebe may be one of them. There's a couple of caveats, let me give you their warnings here. First, these are deaconesses, not pastors not elders. There is no hint of authority given to them, but service opportunities. They, just like the deacons, are not in a authority role unless the elders give them that. These deaconesses were working uh, for the church, and likely they'd be working with women. Second, this is all we've got. This and 1 Timothy 3 and the hint in 1 Timothy chapter 5 about worthy widows being enrolled in the work are good strong hints that these, these things can have happened in the first century. And we see some hints from early literature that that may have happened. However, Paul is not contradicting himself about leadership roles for women. And you do realize we've already done that here. Right? right? We had a full-time woman on staff running all of our Bible classes for some years. So this is, and we should be following the excellent qualifications given for the women for deacons there. This is not some radical woman preacher going through. But she's described that. But what's, what are the Romans supposed to be doing for her? Give her whatever she needs. This is likely to cost them some money to help her in her work. And she's 
going to, she has been already very helpful to many and for Paul, right? Okay. So she's already been useful. The next, and then, and so it makes sense that she is first if she has the letter with her, <laughs> has brought the letter to them, and maybe even taking it from church to church, each of these groups and more, to be able to make sure everybody gets the chance to make their own copy of the letter. That was commonly done if they could afford to do so, and make sure everybody has it read in their churches. Well, let's keep reading. Here's number two. Somebody else is in Rome that Paul is very interested in. Greet, greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who have risked their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Greet also the church that meets at their house. So in Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 4, we find, 1 through 4, we find Paul meeting Priscilla and Aquila. And I've mentioned this a number of times in class because they were there in Corinth because they had been expelled from Rome by the emperor along with all of the Jews. And they had helped Paul in tremendous ways. What had they both done in Corinth? Are you aware of why Paul stayed with them? First, they asked him to stay, of course. They were of the same occupation, tent makers. They were tent makers. Um, what's a tent maker? Why do you need tents? Was camping a big thing in, in Rome, do you think? Some people live in tents. Some people live in tents. They do. Absolutely. But, of course, Paul is from Tarsus. I'm not sure there's a big Bedouin faction in Tarsus, in uh, Cilicia, a very civilized part of the world. Or the Bedouins might be more down in, in Arabia and in the Middle East. But here we are up in Asia Minor. Um, who still bivouacs in tents? Businesses use tents quite often. What if you have a legion? And armies going throughout the world. Where do you put them up at? You can try and put them up elsewhere. But you've got to have tents for an army. And Rome has its legions. And so as a tent maker. You likely are a military contractor. <laughs> You're involved in the defense industry. And we all know that can be rather lucrative. So P Paul... And Priscilla and Aquila are quite able to support themselves. And they're putting up Paul in their home in Corinth, even though they've only lately arrived there themselves. And here in Rome, they're able to put up the church in their home. Um, tell me a little, bit, a little bit more of him. How are they going to risk their lives for Paul? Is it safe to have Paul in your house? Not necessarily, and they're going to... Uh, what about Priscilla and Aquila? Are they Jews or Gentiles? They are serving the... They are... All the church of the Gentiles have to be grateful to them. But are they Jews or Gentiles themselves? Gentiles. They may be... You would think Gentiles from this, wouldn't you? Would. You would think. But why did they get thrown out of Rome? Because the emperor had thrown all of the Jews out of Rome. So uh, history suggests to us uh, there is some possibility of Priscilla herself being a, no a Roman of noble birth. But that is more conjecture and, and story. But there is the name Priscilla prominently among uh, the royal family, among the uh, emperor's family. She may very well be a Roman noble, and one of the reasons why they have enough money to do these things, but Aquila would, was a Jew. So uh, at least that is a traditional thought about it. But uh, they are the first ones Paul greets. 
think about uh, all the things they have done with Paul. We know that they are the ones who, who uh, converts Apollos to the faith in Ephesus. But that's because they've, Paul has been in Corinth for a year and a half. And they leave Corinth with Paul to go to Ephesus. And Paul will speak two, two, uh, uh, two Sabbaths in the synagogue. And they beg him to stay. And he says, no, I've got to go to Jerusalem, but I'll be back. And after that is when Priscilla and Aquila hear Apollos preaching the things of the Lord in the synagogue. But not, not perfectly because he, doesn't, he only knows the, the baptism of John. And they take him aside privately. And Apollos will go on to Corinth after he learns the way of the Lord more accurately. And somehow they end up in Rome and Paul will come back and have one of his greatest works there in Ephesus. Who's his advance man? A Priscilla and Aquila. They've already been there sharing the word. And so has Apollos in, in somewhat his uh, erroneous way for Paul has to convert some of, their, of his followers who only know the baptism of John. How, in, how is this, uh, not only is Paul very close to them, but how does this greeting fit the whole point of the book? Think about what this book's about. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes to who first and also who? The Jew first and also the Greek. Yeah. Jews and Gentiles. And, of course, we go through the sins of the, of the Gentiles and then the sins of the Jews in chapters 1 and 2. And all have sinned, chapter 3. And we are going, we've discussed all about the Jews' rejection of the gospel, God's grafting into the Gentiles. This message of one church, Jew and Gentile, here is a, a Paul takes the opportunity when greeting Priscilla and Aquila to remind them, these Jews have done a great work in exactly what we're talking about, bringing Jew and Gentile together. CR, could you uh, cut us back just a little bit? I'm getting some ringing down here. Okay, I had those questions for you. Greet Epinetus, Epin, Epinetus, who was the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. Why could Epinetus be the first convert in Asia and we never read anything about him in the book of Acts? You know, the, the first convert in Philippi is Lydia and the next one seems to be the jailer. These first converts sometimes can be very important. Those who, who listen to Paul in Athens, several are named. Um, Damaris the Areopagite for one. Why wouldn't he be named? Well, think of chapter 16, verse 6. Why does Paul have the Macedonian call? Because he's trying to go into Asia. He wants to go into Asia, and the Spirit prevents him and lets him have this vision of the Macedonian man saying, come over to Macedonia and help us, and he never goes to, F to Asia. Asia was a Roman province made up of four minor kingdoms, from the, of the past, including Ephesus. That's why those seven churches are the seven churches of Asia. They're not just from Asia Minor. They're from actually the province of Asia. They're the Roman province. And so this individual being the very first one there, well, Paul, made, Paul evidently heard of his conversion and may or may not have actually known him personally. Greet Mary, who worked very hard for you. How many Marys can you name from the Gospels? I assume it's not one of those, or Paul probably could have given that distinction. Who, who can you name? Jesus' mother, Mary Magdalene. Mary what? Mary and Martha, the sisters, Mary Clopas, um, 
Yeah, at least four or five. Um, actually, I believe. Anyway, there's a number of Marys there with there with Jesus, and then they're there at the resurrection. Um, they're very important. This is not one of them. But how do you like the way she's described? Can Jesus? Can Paul say that about us? This somebody. It's a hard worker. This is somebody who's been working for us. For, it, for them. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my fellow countrymen and fellow prisoners. They are outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. What's Paul's country? What's Paul's country? He may be referring to being a Roman citizen. He could even be referring to the city of Tarsus. That they could have been from Tarsus as well. He may simply be referring to them also as Jews because he calls all of the Jews his countrymen here. Whenever he talks about he wished he could be, um, he could be accursed for them previously in the book. But I, I tend to think that they may even be from Tarsus, and therefore they would be doubly his countrymen. They would be Roman citizens if they were born there. They know him. But uh, how narrow is this window of when they are converted? Paul's converted in AD 37. And on that timeline, Jesus dies and buried and resurrected in AD 33. And later in the year, Pentecost takes place. At the end of the summertime. In AD 33. So this is just a, about a four to five year span of time. Of a possibility. Of how long, these guys have been converted a long time. Yeah. Have you thought about. The Christians. Who became Christians. Who. Before Paul was converted. Why would Paul know the names of the most outstanding Christians who were converted before he was in Rome, in Jerusalem? If he's in Jerusalem, he's about to persecute them. They could have been on his most wanted list. Uh, you never know. Yes. He was a persecutor first before he was converted, wasn't he? You're absolutely right. Greet Ampolitus. Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. That's all we know about Ampliatus, but that's, that's special. Paul knows him, and Paul loves him as a personal individual. Stychus, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, Urbanus means... Uh, and Urbanus means uh, city bread. It's a common name for Roman slaves. And yes, uh, the Latin urban is a part of that. Stychus, the word for Stychus, his beloved Stychus, is the Greek name that means a head of grain or a ear of grain. It's ra a rare name, but it was not rare among members of the imperial household. Greet Ampelis, who is approved in, in Christ. He's tried and true. The interesting thing is, uh, it was a common name, but in the first century when Paul writes this, there is a famous actor in the city of Rome. Greet those who are among who belong to the household of Aristobulus. That's a fascinating reference. Herod the Great had his grandson, Aristobulus. He's already dead by this time. Some of this members of his family, perhaps some of his slaves, were Christians, and it's put right next to Greet Herodian. 
possibly another member of Herod's family, and his countrymen. Many translations read, and literally this is his kinsman. He may be a relative of Paul's. Greet those who from the household of Narcissus, who are in the Lord. Another famous, there is a famous freedman named Narcissus who had been executed by Agrippa. And this, there, this may be his household who has Christians among it. Um, Greet, this is a fascinating pair of names, Tryphena and Tryphosa. Women who have worked hard in the Lord. Tryphena and Tryphosa, they're two, two forms of essentially the same root name. And so they're often thought to be sisters, maybe even twins. And <clears throat> this is a, a very ironic greeting considering the meaning of their name because the name actually means to live in luxury. They didn't live in luxury. They worked hard for the Lord. Greet my beloved Persis, who has worked very hard in the Lord. A freedman in history had this name, and everyone loved her because of her hard work. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord and his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. Rufus is named elsewhere, including Mark chapter 15 and verse 21. Remember what his, he may be the brother of Alexander, and his father's name was Simon, and he was from modern day uh, Libya. What did Simon do, the father of Rufus and Alexander, in Mark 15? He carried the cross for Christ. He was compelled to do so. And most think the name Rufus and Alexander are well-known Christians. One would, one would think this is the Simon. You know him. His father, he's the father of Rufus and Alexander. He had an equally wonderful mother, it seems like, for Paul considers her his mother too. At least it's a fascinating possibility. These are things we cannot know, but it's, it's good to, to get a little more detail when we can. Verse 14. A Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermas, and the brothers with them. Fascinating names. Asyncritus, there was a freedman from a, that had belonged to Augustus Caesar by that name. Hermes was another common slave. Patrobus, there was a freedman belonging to Nemo, had, who had belonged to Nebo, Nero by that name. Hermas was a common slave name shortened from Hermogenes or Hermagora. And since each one of these names seems to have uh, commonly associated with freedmen, perhaps this is a church largely made up of former slaves. Remember, it was a church made up of former slaves, that a, a synagogue made up of former slaves, who brought accusation against Stephen and brought him before the council where he was eventually stoned to death. It was the freedmen's synagogue who did that. So uh, freedmen tended, tended to uh, hang together. Greet Philogius and Julia. Nerus and his sister and Olympus and all the saints with them. Philogius and Julia are common female, male and female slave na names. Um, the name Nerus was found in inscriptions of the royal household. His sister is not named, 
No one knows exactly why, he's, why she's not named, but uh, it might have been dangerous for her to be named. And this may be another house church. Then we should be familiar with chapter 16, verse 16. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Always be grateful that all the huggers among us haven't really taken this to heart. At least they're just hugging us, right? I, I'm, I'm not a big hugger. You have noticed this. I will hug you if you hug me. That's okay. But that, I don't initiate a lot of hugs. I'm a handshaker. Why didn't he say, um, greet one another with a holy handshake? This is their custom. The handshake hasn't been invented. won't be invented until medieval, medieval times to prove that you're unarmed. So, evidently, there is no handshake, and this was their custom. Be affectionate to one another. Be greeting to one another. Don't, don't hi-hat each other that, or snub one another. Med medieval times, it's thought that perhaps the handshake was to prove, I have no weapon in this hand. <laughs> in my, and it's always the right hand because that's usually our dominant hand. Are you right-handed? I was definitely on right hand. I am too. Nobody tried to smack my left hand because I was riding with it. I had the right hand. I was safe. Uh, some of the kids my age. I would break my old joke and make surprise. Mm -hmm. I would sell my right hand and give me a handshake. Yeah, you use your right hand for handshake. Somebody had to teach that. I can't get that through to my puppy. My puppy wants to give me the hand right closest. He, he's a left-hand handshaker. Um, have you memorized this reference, Romans 16, 16? Yeah, this is where, and we need to be using this term in this way. The word, the, a single church is never, is never called a church of Christ in the Bible. But, we're not, but I, I love the term church of Christ, especially when we use it well. It is the term that has been used for hundreds of years. When trying to talk about the church as God wants it in the Bible. And as denominational people who believe they're just a little part of the church of Christ. Want to talk about the church. They'll call it the church of Christ. That's all I want to be a member of. And here churches of Christ in the plural is used. And it is a Bible name along with the churches of the Galatians. The churches, the church in Corinth. The church of God, the assembly of the firstborn. And here, this is a Bible name. There's lots of names folks use that aren't Bible names, don't, aren't there? Yeah. So it's a good reference to have in your back pocket and remember as you study, with, as you talk with other people. Now comes a more difficult part of this chapter. I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who are in verse 17. To watch out for those who create divisions and obstacles that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Turn away from them. For such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. What makes these people different from the weak we just read about in chapters 14 and 15? That we need to encourage and sustain and not hurt their faith and pay attention and if necessary not eat anything, not eat any meat if it's going to bother them. What's the difference between these folks that we've, got to, that we've got to turn away from and the other folks that we've got to be careful not to put a stumbling block in front of? What makes the difference? They're only interested in themselves, number one. Yes? They're charlatans. That's true. They do not have pure motives. Yes? They don't want to share. They don't want to share the gospel. They don't want to share it with others. And they are teaching false doctrine here. They are doing things that are contrary to the things you've learned. They are contradicting the truth. God doesn't really care about what you eat, does he? But God certainly cares about how you live. 
And there are those who have turned the gospel into license and say you get to do whatever you want to do. There are those who have done all kinds of things contrary to the doctrine. Is it very easy to tell the difference between a matter of scruples and opinion and a matter of truth? It's not always easy. It's not always easy. And we have to beware of the pharisaical attitude of I've got it all right. And we've got to be aware of the libertine attitude of it's all all right. Either way, it's very, very tough. And so we do this in love. But that's the tough job that's assigned to elders is sometimes mark those who are walking contrary to the doctrine. Everyone has heard about your obedience. So I rejoice over you, but I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. What's meant here about being wise about good and innocent about evil? Why is this, has Jesus told the seven to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves? You know, we don't need to know everything there is to know about sin. We need to know everything there is about being righteous and doing good, good for our neighbors. Yeah. We, have to, we have to be aware of what is wrong. But we don't have to get into all the nitty gritty details, do we? But some folks want to know everything about, about the bad stuff. Timothy, let's, now we're turning to the, to the workers. We have greeted everybody in Rome, and now and they've been given a final warning, and now Paul wants to give greetings from those with him. Timothy, my fellow worker, sends you greetings, and as do Lucius, Jason, and Sosipater, my fellow countrymen. I, Tertius, who wrote the, down this letter, Greet you in the Lord. Gaius, who has hosted me in all the church, sends you greeting. Erastus, the city treasurer, sends you greetings, as does our brother Quartus. Um, Timothy is quite well known to us. Uh, the recipient of, of First and Second Timothy, his mother uh, and grandmother were Eunice and Lois. His father was a Greek. Paul circumcised him. Uh, in order to make him a, a, a better received evangelist. Uh, Lucius is mentioned in Acts chapter 13 and verse 1. Jason in Acts chapter 17 verses 5 through 9. He's from Thessalonica it seems most likely. Sosipater is a longer form of Sopater from Acts chapter 20 and 4 quite possibly. Tertius who writes down this letter? Well, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Thessalonians 3, 1 Corinthians 16, and Colossians chapter 4 also mention uh, that perhaps Paul signs the letter with his own hand at the end, at one, at one occasion saying, with saying, How large a letter I write with my own hand? And uh, Paul would often uh, probably use and Someone called an amanuensis. That is a secretary who took down the dictation of the letter. Uh, Gaius or Gaius um, is named as one of the few that perhaps Paul himself uh, baptized into Christ in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 14, I baptized Crispus and Gaius. And uh, then the household of Stephanus he mentions um, the name Erastus. The city treasurer. Um, at one time it was thought that this was a, uh, um, an error. That uh, there was no such thing as a city treasurer. Um, but uh, that was proven false. That the, the word was commonly used. And in fact, this, names, this name, Erastus, is actually on one of his public works in the city of Corinth. There is a paving stone still in existence that you can go see today with his name, Erastus, who paved that area. Um, in Acts chapter 19 and verse 22, 
he uh, may have, uh, Paul may have actually sent Erastus with Timothy on to Macedonia when he went on to Ephesus. Um, um, let's see. Now to him who is able to strengthen you by my gospel and by the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery concealed for ages crass, but cra- past, but now revealed and made known through the writings of the prophets, by the command of the eternal God, in order to lead all nations to the obedience that comes from faith, to the only wise God be glory forever, through Jesus Christ, amen. Uh, this is a very full full blessing as he ends this book. Notice verse 26. I think that that is a uh, that little footnote G is important. Just because uh, Paul in preaching salvation by faith never demeans obedience to the gospel or obedience. It is the obedience of faith. It's just not on the basis or it, 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 faith is the, uh, not the basis for our salvation. It fits with Romans chapter 1 verse 16. For the gospel is the power of God to salvation. It is the, uh, the power that uh, for in it is revealed the righteousness of God from faith to faith. How about if Paul was writing our city? You think he'd mention you? Would he mention me? Would he mention the saints at West Freeway? Have we made an impact on our community? I, I hope we have. I hope we have, and I hope we still are. Do we have the courage to refuse the divisive and the love to bear with the weak? And the wisdom to know the difference? And... Uh, how do other Christians in our area know us as a church? Is anybody going to be asking, hey, you go to West Freeway in 10 years? Did you know, Chris? I hope somebody will. Before we close with song, don't forget to pick up one of these. This is for Sunday evening. By the way, tonight we will not have our small groups on this holiday weekend. So no small groups at 2, but we will... We will continue with our small groups. We're going to, these are out in the foyer. Please get one. But this is a, we're going to be studying the miracles of Jesus, a few selected miracles of Jesus, just uh, 12 of them. And uh, John said in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, that many other signs did Jesus in the presence of his, his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you believe that Jesus, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life through His name. So, if if miracles had a purpose in being recorded, let's look for that, and we'll see several miracles, including uh, the nine leper, uh, the ten lepers being healed. Um, we have. Blind Bartimaeus being healed. There's, uh, and each of the miracles chosen has a message. So uh, I think you'll enjoy it and be sure you're inviting others. Yes. Joe, what's... Or, yes. Go ahead. Next week. Next, week. James. Next week we will begin a study of the book of James to take us through the summer. And Joe will be doing that. I actually mentioned earlier that you'd be taking over class and we're going to ask you what. Glad you said you piped up because I was supposed to ask already. Next week we'll be studying the book of James. James chapter 1 verse 1. James chapter 1 verse 1. And I asked you all those questions. Are you ready to, to sing us out? Give me the heart of a servant, tender and faithful and true. Fill me with love and use me, O Lord, so that the world can see you. We'll look forward to hearing Joe this morning.
for the sermon and next week in class. God bless you. We'll see you then. Pardon me? I'm trying to. Just trying to get, you know, the, the pews have been getting too full. No, not at all. Yes. James.